Hello everybody, uh, this is our lecture on soil organic matter and um, right here on the title page I just want uh, you guys to notice it says adapted from the University of Minnesota Extension pub uh, publication called Soil Organic Matter Does Matter and so I've also put that um, publication in as a reading on the um, in the module so if you have time and you want more information or you want more detailed information or you have like a question and you're not sure, um, I would say read that publication and then uh, let me know if you still have any questions after this lecture or after reading that publication. So let's start with kind of the easy stuff. What is soil organic matter? So um, the kind of textbook definition of soil organic matter would be the organic fraction of the soil that includes plant, animal, and microbial residues in various stages of decomposition, biomass of soil microorganisms, and substances produced by plant roots and other soil organisms. And you guys know I'm not huge fans of big, long, complicated definitions. So um, how about just the material in soil derived from other living organisms? Uh, this is mostly going to come from plant tissue, um, but that's what we're talking about. So when we say this um, plant animal microbial residues in various stages of decomposition, it's material in soil derived from other living organisms, and it um, can be in various stages of decomposition. So where does it come from? So all organic matter comes from plant tissue um, when you think about it. So even if it's like, uh, let's say it's some sort of a dead animal um, or, or feces from a dead animal, what is that animal eating? So they're either eating plant tissue or they're eating another animal. But what was that other animal eating? It was probably plant tissue. So um, the idea is that all organic matter really comes from, from plant tissue. And then um, the microbes in the soil decompose organic matter to sustain their life process. That's how they, that's how they get energy. That's how they, um, that's how they sustain life. So in this little um, uh, graphic that I've put in here, so step one, the plant matter is turned into soil. And so then we have nutrients and carbon. Then you have soil microbes releasing stored nutrients from the plant matter and making them um, the nutrients available, then the nutrients are released by the microbes and taken up by the plants, and then the microbes will generate more organic matter and then continue the cycle of building and storing nutrients in the soil. And so that's how this kind of cycle just keeps going of um, microbes eating and, uh, and creating soil organic matter. So what is soil organic carbon? Because some people use those terms um, similarly. Well, soil organic carbon makes up the majority of soil organic matter. So about 58%, so almost 60% of soil organic matter is soil organic carbon. So that's why you'll see them kind of used interchangeably. The rest of soil organic matter is made of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, if you wanted, to, if you saw numbers for soil carbon, soil organic carbon as opposed to soil organic matter, um, you could just multiply your soil organic carbon number by 1.7, and that would be what your soil organic matter is. And so on the right hand side here, I've got a little diagram showing just the idea of kind of a simplified carbon cycle of um, the idea of the carbon. Um, going into the plant via photosynthesis and then um, the roots releasing some carbon compounds and then um, that's how we get carbon into the soil because uh, soil holds carbon well and then organic matter and through decomposition carbon is released back into the atmosphere. In the United States um, this is kind of what it looks like in terms of soil organic carbon. So you can see high amounts of carbon uh, in the kind of Great Lakes area um, down at the Gulf of Mexico and then like the East Coast and the Pacific Northwest. Those are kind of our higher uh, areas in terms of organic carbon. So levels of organic matter. So when we're talking about um, the majority of mineral soils, they'll have usually somewhere between trace amounts. So not zero, but a little bit above zero to 20% um, soil organic matter in the mineral soil. 
if they have greater than 20% organic matter and it goes to a depth of uh, 16 inches, that's what's called peat or muck. And there's a picture of peat or muck on the uh, right hand side there. And those would fall into the soil order histosols. There's 12 soil orders and histosols is one of them. And histosols have a high organic matter content and no permafrost because these are in cold, cold, much colder areas. They're usually saturated year-round, but a few are freely drained, and they are commonly called bogs, moors, peats, or mucks because you can see what the soil looks like. And if that soil's wet, it's going to be pretty, pretty mucky. Um, histosols form in decomposed plant remains that accumulate in water, forest litter, or moss faster than they decay. These soils are drained and exposed to air. Microbial decomposition is accelerated, and the soils may subside dramatically. Histosols make up about 1% of the world's ice-free land surface. So not a whole lot of area is covered by this sort of um, soil that's really high in organic matter. So most of the soils, you're going to get somewhere between 0 and 20% of the soils um, of the organic matter in those soils. But in these specific histosols, these peat or mucks, you're going to have more than 20%. So we've talked before about the idea of the O layer and the O layer being the organic layer. And so um, how, how do we define an organic layer as, you know, like how is an organic layer or an O layer different from the topsoil, the A layer? And the, the difference is that the, to be an O layer, it's got to have greater than 20% soil organic carbon by the weight of the soil. And so that's that's the idea. If it's got greater than 20%, it's going to be an O layer. But then you also see in this graphic on the right, you see those different um, little uh, lowercase letters. And so those are sublayers. And the sublayers, um, the three that we'll talk about are the OI, the OE, and the OA. So OI is slightly decomposed. You can still identify the plant and animal material. An OE layer is inter intermediately decomposed. You can kind of identify some plant parts. An OA layer is highly decomposed. You can't identify the original source of the material. And so it, so looking at this uh, picture on the right, there's an OE layer. So uh, I'm assuming if we could um, get closer up on that, we'd be able to see some sort of um, maybe plant roots or um, or twigs or something that's that's an obvious... Uh, plant part, whereas in those OA layers, we're probably not going to be able to distinguish anything or really see um, and know exactly where it came from. So when we try and um, look at the, the classifications of organic matter, it's important to remember that uh, not all organic matter is created equal. So a good example is like an animal carcass versus a large log. Um, that log, it, it, there's going to be different chemicals between the carcass and the log. There's going to be definitely different decomposition rates. Maybe um, uh, certainly between like uh, I think the uh, paper gives the example of a mouse carcass versus a large log on the ground. That log is going to take a long time to decompose. That mouse carcass is going to decompose very quickly. Um, but there's a lot more probably for the soil um, or a lot more to be gained in organic matter in that large log than there is in that little mouse carcass. And so it's it's important to just kind of um, remember that it's not all the same. Um, but we do um, classify soil into basically two or soil organic matter into two main categories. And so those two categories are active and stable. And so active organic matter, that's the portion of um, organic matter where um, it's actually decomposing. So the idea that, it, it, that it's active, like it's actively decomposing. So it's not, it's not um, it hasn't finished decomposing. It's still uh, working its way where you can still see some of it. So if we were talking about this in, a, in the um, O layer, this would be an OI or an OE because we could still see some of the stuff that it came from. We could still um, see what the, what the material was before it's, it's just organic matter. Um, this this uh, type of organic matter really fuels microbial activity. 
because you get a lot of the release of the nutrients in into the soil because um, this the active organic matter is easy for microbes to digest and use for their metabolism so they're able to eat it and get energy and then want to keep working um, fresh crop residues are a really good source of active organic matter um, active organic matter contains sugars oils cellulose and proteins so those are excellent sources of energies and energy and nutrients for soil organisms and this can really um, change um, growing season to growing season because it's definitely not always the same amount of active organic matter um, every single year. Your stable organic matter, um, that's, that's your organic matter that's already decomposed. So that would be that OA de uh, designation where you, you can't really recognize what it came from. It's, it's just kind of organic matter. Um, this makes up the majority of soil organic matter, so anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of the total. So your active organic matter is going to be anywhere between um, 40 to 10 percent of your soil organic matter, whereas your stable organic matter is going to be anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of the total. As soil organisms digest and decompose the material, several things are going to happen. The, the chemistry of the organic matter is going to be modified and the nutrients are going to be removed as the microbes uh, decompose the material and the organic matter is going to stick to soil particles, which is going to become a really important idea. Um, the big thing is that sta stable organic matter accumulates when active microbes continually are decomposing organic matter. So when they are continually decomposing organic matter, uh, you can just kind of start building up organic matter and building up organic matter and building it up and building it up and building it up. And that's that's uh, when everything's going uh, good. We're going to talk about that in uh, in depth a little bit more later on as to why there's when that's going good, it's good. But when it's not going good, it's actually um, pretty bad for the soil. So here is um, the, um, the cycle of organic matter where you start off with fresh residues or what we call kind of um, plant material and all that um, stuff that comes from soil organisms. So uh, something dies, whether it's the plant or an animal or it's poop or any of those things. Um, so within days, you're going to get some release of CO2 and... Um, and some of it going back into soil organisms within months, the same thing, within years, the same thing. Um, but after years, you're going to start to see organic matter uh, get protection in aggregates, which we'll um, talk about uh, in, in the next uh, slide. And then after decades, they start getting fixed to soil particles, so they actually stick to soil particles. And that's where we'll go from the active organic matter where it's, it's decomposing to then stable organic matter where it's completely decomposed and all you can see is organic matter. Or actually, I guess it's, it's uh, the aggregates is another slide, but we'll get there. Humus. Uh, we talked about humus in terms of organic matter. Uh, humus is what they used to think uh, stable organic matter was. But uh, now it's uh, it's a major form of organic matter in the soil. But stable organic matter comes from microbial microbially derived complex or microbial microbially derived products that can be simple or complex. And so um, humus is still used, and sometimes you'll see people talking interchangeably with stable organic matter and humus but really humus is a complex stable pool of organic matter but it's not uh, saying the same thing as um, stable organic matter now we get to aggregates and aggregation so as soil particles stick and bind together they form aggregates um, active and stable organic matter can be trapped in these aggregates so if we look at the picture on the left those kind of um, the when the soil binds together like that that's aggregation so when this happens though the soil particles are going to act like armor and protect the organic matter um, from decomposers which is great because that's how we get and go from this active organic matter to stable organic matter and we get stable organic matter once we have that to then start building up because it's protected from the decomposers 
And so um, soil organic matter accumulates during long periods of time, like we just showed in the cycle um, from years to decades to centuries. And the majority of soil organic matter is a result of decomposition and aggregation that has occurred during a long period of time. And we're usually, that's when we're talking about, you know, decades to centuries and even longer. Uh, healthy soil has a mix of active and stable organic matter and a steady supply of organic inputs such as crop residues and manure will help build and maintain uh, stable organic matter pools and provide a wide array of benefits to the soil. So the, the active and stable organic matter getting trapped in these aggregates may sound um, almost like a bad thing, but really it's fantastic for them because they get protection from decomposers. And this is how we start really building up organic matter in the soil. And so, um, and that's something we want because we know that's how the plants get their nutrients. So uh, what are some of the benefits of soil organic matter? Uh, we're going to go over six benefits. We're going to go over water retention and drainage, soil structure, nutrient cycling and retention, cation exchange capacity, microbial diversity and resiliency, and crop yield. In terms of water retention and drainage, soil organic matter increases the ability of a soil to receive and hold more water. So the particulate organic matter in soil serves as lightweight, low density bulking agent. So basically think of um, a sponge. And so if, if this uh, particulate organic matter acts like a sponge, it's gonna help uh, the soil create and maintain large pore spaces that allows water to infiltrate and drain and, and also small pore spaces that the water can hold on to. So basically imagine sticking a sponge that into your soil or letting a spongy material get into your soil. That's going to bring in water. It's going to hold water and it's going to basically swell up and just keep water in there. So soil organic matter, because of the way it um, is being lightweight and low density, it just has this great ability to just take in water and hold on to it, which we know, um, especially for sandy soils or, um, clay soils those can be kind of an issue so definitely something that we would want to have in our soil definitely a benefit in terms of our soil structure um, we talked about this before this idea of the aggregation active organic matter um, specifically though forms uh, sticky substances that help soil particles hold together so that helps soil develop and maintain that aggregate structure but doing this also feeds the microbes that help them grow and metabolize. So in terms of soil structure, physical benefits, better aeration, so um, better um, uh, the pores are open to where air can come in and out um, very easily. Better friability, so the idea of the soil being able to um, come apart easier, but not... Um, not to where it's just falling apart, but that it can, um, it's got like a plastic nature to it. It's, it can be moved and shaped um, easier. Uh, less crusting, so it doesn't get um, hard. It gets, it can be um, um, kind of uh, softer. It doesn't get really that hard um, type of soil that we see a lot when we think about um, compaction issues, the way soil can get, um, can get really hard and, and kind of loses that moisture, loses the aeration and the moisture in the soil. And then better water infiltration, drainage, and retention. The biological benefits from um, having organic matter in there is that there's now a home for microbes, worms, and insects. So we get the whole soil food web started. And then um, we also, um, it helps that, uh, that not only in providing that home for those, species but then that allows those species to do what they do in terms of building up um, more organic matter and, uh, and bringing in um, and working their way through the soil food web and creating that whole fertile ecosystem that that we want the other biological benefit is food storage because of um, the way organic matter is structured it's going to be a slow release of food for the microbes so it's going to keep the microbes around if it's healthy organic matter and let them get some food but then have this kind of consistent um, source of food. 
nutrient cycling and retention. So um, active organic matter is full of fresh, accessible nutrients. So as the soil organisms break down and decompose soil organic matter, the nutrients will be consumed by the soil organisms and then released into the soil solution. So remember where a soil solution is just, we're talking about um, water and soil mixing together, just like we did in lab. We just took, um, when we were testing our water, we just put a little bit of soil in there, put some water in there, or sorry, when we were testing our pH, put a little soil in there, put our little water in there, and we made a little soil solution. That's what's happening in the soil as the water and uh, the water and the air get in the pores, they're creating that soil solution. And so the nutrients basically get loosened up and get put into the soil solution. And then the organisms will be able to um, get them for there, uh, from there. Also, because uh, they're put into that soil solution, they're free for uptake by plants and other organisms. Um, or they can be lost to leaching or volatilization, meaning that sometimes they don't get picked up and they just kind of disappear. They get leached down farther down into the soil or they volatilize and um, work their way um, back into other um, inorganic forms. And so as long as active organic matter is decomposing, it will provide the slow and steady supply of nutrients into the soil solution, which is absolutely what we want because that's that cycling of nutrients and that's um, the fertile soil that we're looking for. Cation exchange capacity, which is something we talked about before, the idea of um, the um, plant, for a plant to be able to get uh, nutrients, the way that they're, the nutrients are available is as an ion, and a cation is a positive charged ion. So the exchange capacity of the cation exchange capacity is just looking at how easily can these cations go from the plants to the soil. And so soil organic matter provides between 20 and 80 percent of the cation exchange capacity in mineral soil. So they're really a driver of this exchange of um, this exchange of ions in the soil. And in general, the higher the organic matter uh, content in the soil, the higher the cation exchange capacity and the more likely the soil is actually going to retain nutrients and be healthy and fertile and have nutrients available. A higher um, cation exchange capacity also allows the soil to be more resistant to rapid and large changes and protects nutrient availability and health in the soil. So remember with pH, um, we know that you have to, um, you have to do things like adding fertilizers or um, trying to reduce acidity if your soil doesn't fall within that um, really nice six and a half to seven and a half um, pH range where we, we know plants uh, do best because it's best for, uh, it's ideal for plant growth. And so, um, you know, if you have a soil and you finally get it into that, um, that proper range or the soil is already in that proper pH range, um, having a really high uh, cation exchange capacity really makes it easier for that soil to stay in that range for longer and resist um, changes based on something like, um, you know, having a drought or dealing with farming or having something where um, it might change um, the the pH of the soil. It's It's more likely to be more resistant to that change if it's got that higher cation exchange capacity. And so having more organic matter is going to make that easier. In terms of microbial diversity and resiliency, soil microbes are important for driving nutrient cycles and influencing the availability of the nutrients to the plant. Uh, organic matter provides a source of nutrients and energy to the microbes. So then soil organic matters important for creating and maintaining soil microbial habitat. So not only is the organic matter um, giving nutrients and, enemy to, nutrients and energy to the microbes, it's also creating and maintaining the habitat. And so if we want to have a lots of microbial uh, diversity, we're going to need a variety of habitat conditions. So soil organic matter is going to maintain these aerobic and anaerobic conditions wet and dry conditions in the soil, nutrient rich and nutrient poor conditions, and large and small pore spaces. And it's going to help maintain these conditions in the soil so that it can have lots of microbes and have this kind of resiliency. 
Organic matter helps create a mix of these conditions and a variety of homes to support the diversity that we rely on for soil function. And if you're saying, well, how does it create these different conditions? How does it create this um, diversity? Remember it that um, among all the different types of soil or um, layers of soil, organic matter is a layer of soil that's under constant change all the time it's not going to be the same because it's having the microbes um, decomposing um, constantly and having fungus and mycelia doing some decomposition and um, it's always kind of in the state of change and, and, and this fluctuation. So it can create, it can have large and small pore spaces and nutrient rich and nutrient poor conditions and wet and dry conditions and aerobic and anaerobic conditions because it's always changing. There's always um, there's never a consistent amount of organic matter because it, it's always in flux with that idea of active organic matter where it's going through the decomposition phase. Plus, you also have the stable organic matter where that's already gone through that phase. And so that mixing of those two things plus the idea that you're, you're going through that constant change allows for you to have that variety of habitat conditions, which then allows for you to have species diversity in the soil. And then our, our last benefit is crop yield. And crop yield, um, the big thing with that is it's only up to a certain point that um, organic matter really um, helps out with yield. But the, the real thing to think about is that if organic matter is already helping with productivity and structure and soil health, then um, it's definitely probably gonna help with, with the yield that you get from your crop. and the idea of having more organic matter is definitely better than having less organic matter. It just might be that there's a certain point you get to where you have enough organic matter, but definitely um, you would notice a difference if you didn't have enough organic matter um, for your crop. So how do you build soil organic matter? Well, that's the idea of the, the microbes and the organic and the organic matter coming together and, and being really important for productivity and health of the soil. So um, for the microbes to grow and do their many jobs, and they are the drivers of the, of the, the soil ecosystem, um, they're gonna need food, um, a place to live, and then the freedom from drastic physical and chemical disturbances. So basically, almost like any of us, they, they, want, they want food so that they have energy to work. They want a house so they don't have to worry about where they're going to live or what's going to happen. And they don't want to be bothered. They want to just have the freedom to do what they do. And if the soil and if soil organic matter can provide those three things for the microbes, they will just go nuts and be building, um, building organic matter. Uh, these same characteristics provide conditions for increasing um, soil organic matter as well. And so to build, basically the idea that you want to think about is to build organic matter, you got to build the below ground habitat. So if the microbes are incorporating active organic matter into their bodies, um, stable soil matter pool will also grow. So the idea is that if these microbes are incorporating active matter and going through this process of decomposition, then that active matter eventually will become stable organic matter. And when you have more and more stable organic matter, then that'll just keep pulling up and you'll just keep adding and adding and adding organic matter. Um, another thing is to have um, plants in the soil. And so, because living roots um, really keep microbes happy. It's a high quality food source. It kind of boosts their activity. It's just a quick delivery of nutrients to them. So if you have something planted in the ground, the, the microbes become even more happy and are, are willing to work and build more organic matter. Um, these pictures just kind of um, tell the same thing, hopefully in um, a, quicker, a quicker way. So um, four steps to building soil organic matter. This says in the south, but really anywhere. Minimize soil disturbance keep the soil covered with living roots so you know plants sitting there on the soil jack up your diversity so um, all sorts of different plants with different nutrients 
are going to make it easier to um, have more uh, nutrients available for your microbes. And then focus on soil resiliency. How do you make your soil stronger and better and healthier? And on the right there, managing soil organic matter is the key to air and water quality. So if we want to have healthy air and healthy water and productive soil, we need to have soil health and we need to manage for that soil health. But if we can build soil organic matter, then we can definitely destroy soil organic matter. So what, what kind of things do we do that would end up destroying um, soil organic matter. So the biggest thing is that soil organic matter builds when the soil is occupied by vegetation and not disturbed. That's kind of what we were just talking about before. So, well, how would we destroy it? Well, then obviously if we don't have vegetation and we disturb the soil, that's where we're going to run into problems. So um, some sort of physical disturbance where we're disturbing the soil, like uh, when uh, the land is tilled, um, soil structure that holds and protects that organic matter. We talked about that with the aggregates, um, providing armor um, for the for organic matter. Um, when that's broken and disturbed, then the organic matter is um, that was protected is now exposed to decomposers, and so um, we can lose that organic matter that way. And then also just the idea that the soil becomes so aerated that you get this rapid loss of carbon as carbon dioxide and you get a loss of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, if we would um, we um, remove residues, so the idea that if the soil isn't occupied by vegetation, we take all the vegetation off. Residues are just basically the idea of what's left over after a harvest. So if we take off everything off of the surface, that's going to uh, make it hard to build the soil organic matter because we don't have that um, source of material that um, really helps kind of boost up the microbial activity. So we really need to be cautious about how much residue we remove from the field. Erosion then, of course, would then be a problem because topsoil has the highest concentrations of soil organic matter in the soil, but then topsoil is also the layer that is subject to wind and water erosion. So if the topsoil would do were to disappear, then we'd also lose the majority of our organic matter. The other, uh, the other way to destroy soil organic matter is if our carbon to nitrogen reach ratios um, aren't where they need to be. Um, and this really in influences decomposition speed. So a residue with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 1 is the perfect balance, as we can see in this graphic uh, on the top right. It's the perfect balance of energy and nutrients for the soil microorganisms. Um, if, though, you get it higher, to higher um, where you get like 400 to 1 in terms of more carbon than, um, than you have nitrogen, it's not going to provide enough nutrients to support high microbial activity and biomass. Basically, the microbes can't get big and they can't work. They're going um, to, everything's going to kind of slow down. And the microbes, there's not going to be enough um, enough uh, material available for them. And so then they're going to just start looking around and saying, I need more nitrogen. I need more nitrogen. I got to go find nitrogen. So they're going to go take up any nitrogen that they can find. So those soil solutions, stuff that maybe would be going to the, the plant or going to the soil, now all of a sudden is going to the microbes because they don't have enough nitrogen for that for them. So for themselves and they don't have enough nitrogen to survive and they're like nah forget that I'm mean, gonna go get some nitrogen so they'll go find uh, as much nitrogen as they can find to to survive so we call that um, immobilization or where nitrogen is immobilized because um, the microbes don't have enough so they're gonna just scavenge up all the free nitrogen and then we're gonna see a lack of nitrogen um, going to our plants or being in the soil Whereas residues lower than 25 to 1, um, manure and alfalfa, those are good examples with uh, manure being 20 to 1, carbon to nitrogen, and 12 to alfalfa being 12 to 1. They'll supply plenty of nutrients to the microbes. So decomposers have all the nutrients they require, so they're going to remain active, and the decomposers will, um, the decomposition is going to occur quickly. So surplus nitrogen then will be mineralized. So the idea that it's it, you'll have this surplus nitrogen and it's going to just kind of become mineralized. It's going to be available and going to be kind of free nitrogen. So if you have um, 
too little nitrogen, the microbes are going to go all over the place and try and um, take up nitrogen, and you're going to end up with problems. If you have too much nitrogen, that's also going to be a problem, although much less of a problem because it's just going to be the idea that there's free nitrogen around, and it's, it's kind of more like nitrogen's not getting used up. It's just mineralized and, and maybe um, being leached or volatilized. So how can I sum this whole thing up? Soil organic matter matters a lot. It's responsible for maintaining a healthy, productive soil, um, especially just in the idea of providing food and a house for microbes. And microbes, we know, are important to the function of healthy soil, which means soil organic matter is important to the function of health, function of healthy soil, which means that these, the idea of organic matter and microbes are really uh, key drivers of um, the soil ecosystem. Soil organic matter also helps protect our soils from erosion losses through the idea of water retention and drainage and soil structure and that nutrient cycling um, through the uh, through the, the plants and the soil. Um, practices that are good for building and maintaining organic matter in the soil result in a cascade of benefits that complement one another and keep the soil healthy. And it's really just a very good example of an ecosystem of everything having to work together and work in balance and be in harmony for um, you to get the best results. And then soil managed with organic matter in mind is a soil that will be strong, healthy, and resilient long into the future. And so um, that's all I've got to say pretty much about the idea of soil organic matter. I'll just leave you with um, what I thought was kind of a very um, cool little graphic in that um, most of the time you see these kind of uh, these, um, you know, circular cycle graphics. But the thing that I thought that was interesting about this one was the idea of all those hands being in there and the idea that, um, you know, since we are here and we are the ones using the soil and causing um, some of this loss and are the ones using these plants and putting different plants into the ground, we really have to think about how we have our hands in the soil and how we are doing this and are we managing the soil the right way and are we thinking about how important soil organic matter is um, and where organic matter fits in terms of this whole cycle. So. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that and, uh, I will talk to you next time.